From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Anxiety Project podcast. This one is episode 235. Oh my God. I am Brad Robinson, 235. I cannot believe it. It's been years. I remember sitting in a Tim Hortons. That's a coffee shop here in Canada. I remember sitting there and thinking, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to help anybody. If one person, 10 people listen, they're going to take something from this because my aim for the podcast was to provide just the tools, like straightforward. Here's the truth of how to overcome anxiety. No BS, no cutting corners, blatantly telling you how I got out of the chaos and the complete unknown of anxiety and share that with as many people as I can. And that's where I am today. Each episode that I do, my aim is to provide you with as much wisdom and information as that I can within the 30 minutes that I share with you. And so today we're talking about some of the wisdom. Well, I'm providing you with some great passages from amazing books that I highly recommend you check out that have really influenced my life. And that my aim with every episode is to just cram in just the truth of what's required to grow, what's required to lessen anxiety, what's required to lessen depression. And I came from generalized anxiety disorder. So if if you're fairly new to the channel, first of all, welcome. And I came from generalized anxiety disorder, and there are many subcategories to generalized anxiety disorder. I'm talking about agoraphobia, So the fear of fear itself, you know, not being able to leave my home because of the fear of being out in public and losing control and and embarrassing myself in front of other people. And then the depersonalization that accompanied my anxiety and then suffering from PTSD and then suffering from extreme health anxiety, which involved overly obsessing over my symptoms, being hyper-focused on um, the catastrophes around me. If somebody at a Starbucks said something about cancer, I would perk up and it would ruin my day. So that's the person I was. And then social anxiety, the list goes on. And so I became a coach because I... I found passion and meaning within the suffering I was enduring and, and, and moving through. It became a battle against myself when I started to shrink my world down. And when I say shrink my world down, I'm not talking about agoraphobia. I'm talking about minimalizing the amount of things I was chasing every day. So minimalizing certain negative friends or minimalizing certain habits I just know is contributing to my anxiety, minimalizing certain foods that I know is contributing to my anxiety. I noticed that there is much there is much meaning that came from those pursuits and those sacrifices. And that actually brought an unbelievable amount of meaning into my life. I knew that life is just way more exciting than than it just seemed in the past when I was just coping, going with the flow, uh, managing the stress and it and the the yearning and not really like I was drifting a lot in my 20s, a lot, many years of drifting and I, looking back, I just see this stagnant Brad moving around who isn't very exciting, almost like this puppet of the puppet of 
drugs or sex or pornography, the puppet of emotions that are lurking and, and moving around within my older self. And then moving past, moving beyond these seemingly uncontrollable strings and urges and impulses and desires, moving past it, I knowing that I have more in me than I thought, built upon this new outlook of my life. The, my perceptions shifted towards something that I never knew existed before. I, I, my perceptions shifted towards the unknown, that within the unknown, within what I don't know, that's where the growth lies. The adventure lurks within the unknown. And so let's explore more of this unknown today. Let's explore some of the great wisdom, the, some of the great passages I found enlightening within some of the great books that have really impacted me and my recovery and my growth. I want to start with a passage or, sorry, with a quote from me. Being a curious explorer of oneself inevitably creates a new self. You have to explore your being. Look inwards. I was trying to grasp on to a career or a success or fame or fortune that was going to fulfill me. And then I noticed that the fulfillment came when I was sitting alone in the library, not gaining fame or fortune or success, but gaining wisdom from the books that I was reading or gaining this, the, the, the structure I needed to just lessen anxiety and lessen the, the race, the rat race that was just happening all around me, especially here in the Western world. It's just go, go, get things done. You got to go, get it, pursue this. And then for me, going down those lanes, I've, I noticed that there has to be more to life than this. There has to be more to life than this. And so, um, and so, yeah, the first book I recommend to you is Rewire Your Anxious Brain by Catherine Pittman and Elizabeth Carl. Um, this was one of the first books I read about anxiety, about the neuroscience of anxiety that not, not only did I understand, but it opened so many different doors for me. And so the first passage I want to read to you is about the amygdala, the amygdala pathway. And you know the amygdala. If you don't know the amygdala, this is the emotional part of the brain. It's, it's a very ancient part of the brain that initiates this fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's necessary to have this amygdala, well, because you need it to respond to any perceived danger. Even it needs to work reflexively. Like if you're walking down the pathway and you see something that resembles a snake on the pathway, your amygdala operates faster than your cortical pathway. And so you unconsciously jump back, not even knowing what it really is, not even rationalizing what the thing on the ground is that you jump from. It's just this automatic reflexive response. So I want to dive into more of the amygdala in detail in a passage here that I found so fascinating, find so fasc fascinating is about the lateral nucleus within the amygdala. So the passage goes, the amygdala is divided into several sections but we'll focus mainly on two that play essential roles in creating emotional responses, including fear and anxiety. The lateral nucleus is the part of the amygdala that receives incoming me messages from the senses. It constantly scans your experiences and is at the ready to respond to any indication of danger. Like a built-in alarm system, its job is to identify any threat you see, hear, smell, or feel, and then send a danger signal. It gets its information directly from the thalamus. In fact, it receives information before the cortex does, and this is important to keep in mind. The reason the lateral nucleus gets information so fast is because the amygdala pathway is the more direct route from our senses. The amygdala is wired to respond quickly enough to save your life. Its rapid response is possible because of the 
shortcut in brain wiring that allows information to get to the lateral nucleus of the amygdala directly. That is so fascinating. So it responds unbelievably quick to save your life and you don't even comprehend the fact that, well, what did you actually jump from exactly? So when our eyes, ears, nose, or fingertips receive information, the information travels from these sense organs to the thalamus and the thalamus sends this information directly to the amygdala. At the same time, the thalamus also sends the information to the appropriate areas of the cortex for higher level processing. However, the amygdala receives information before the information can be processed by the various lobes in the cortex. So this means the lateral nucleus of the amygdala can react to protect you from danger before your cortex even knows what the danger is. Wow, that is huge. Now let's talk about the central nucleus within the amygdala. The amygdala can accomplish its quick response because of the special properties of another nucleus within it, the central nucleus. This small but powerful cluster of neurons has connections with a number of highly influential structures in the brain, including the hypothalamus and the brain stem. This circuit can signal the sympathetic nervous system to activate the release of hormones into the bloodstream, increasing respiration, activating muscles, all in a fraction of a second. So the sympathetic nervous system is this uh, stress response that is activated from the amygdala, right? That's when excess adrenaline and cortisol is pumped within the bloodstream. The close connection of the central nucleus to elements of the sympathetic nervous system provides the amygdala with a great deal of influence over the body. This is so interesting. The sympathetic nervous system is made up of neurons in the spinal cord that connect with nearly every organ system in the body which allows the sympathetic nervous system to influence dozens of responses from pupil dilation to heart rate. The role of the sympathetic nervous system is to create the fight or flight response, an effect that is balanced by the influences of the parasympathetic nervous system, which allows us to rest and digest. So this is so fascinating because when I was experiencing panic attacks, I was very hyper-focused on these strange and unusual sudden body sensations, increased heart rate, perspiration, hyperventilation, weird aches and pains, um, dizziness, like lack of focus. I was so bewildered and confused, and I get this with all the clients that I meet with. They are so taken aback by the wide variety of weird anomalies occurring within the body. And then reading about this opened my eyes to the fact that it's coming from this ancient brain structure that is, first of all, natural, and second of all, well... We can actually work with our anxiety response to lessen this, right? The reason why we are experiencing these strange sensations is because we have perceived something in our environment as dangerous, right? And at the time, going through my many panic, panicky episodes, I'd say that much of my life was in disarray. There were many snakes I was contending with. So the snakes within me were popping up on a day-to-day -day basis, even though I wasn't physically coming into contact with a lion in the art gallery or on the subway, wherever I was. They were the snakes within my own being that were popping up. Unresolved emotion, unresolved traumas, unresolved 
situations, problems, concerns. I mean, if you're unemployed and if you have uh, some serious situations going on at home and you're out at the bar and you have a panic attack, all of those snakes that are not in the bar, right? Well, they are in you, right? All those snakes at home pertaining to your relationship or pertaining to your unemployment, that's real, man. And they will pop up because those are problems that are not yet fixed. So that was huge reading about that. And then I want to go on to say that the reactions of fight or flight are the most familiar fear responses, but the amygdala can also produce another response to fear that's less recognized, freezing, or becoming very still. In fact, we prefer the term fight, flight, or freeze response because so many people say they feel paralyzed when under extreme stress, right? And I would say that when you we first experience panic we actually freeze because we stop it's like this it's like we retreat inwards at, at like that's what freezing is when you come into contact with something predatory what happens immediately you freeze it's like you're paralyzed that's when you confront medusa the the woman with the head full of the hair full of snakes right it the snakes freeze you automatically that makes sense. So that's what happens when you come into contact with, with, with a snake within you or in real life. As strange as it seems for our ancestors, ancestors, the reaction of freezing may have been a help, as helpful as fighting or fleeing in certain situations, like a rabbit that remains motionless as you walk your dog past her nest. Those who freeze sometimes find an advantage in remaining still when threatened. Very, very interesting. And then I want to read you another passage from, from the book. Let me just flip to the page here. Emotional memories. This is really, really interesting. As discussed earlier in the book, the amygdala forms memories, but not in the way people typically think about memories. On the basis of your experiences, your amygdala creates emotional memories, both positive and negative, that you don't necessarily have an awareness of. Positive emotional memories such as the association of the smell of perfume with feelings of love for your partner usually doesn't cause much difficulty. Therefore, we'll focus on negative emotional memories, especially those that result in fear and anxiety, because these memories can cause a great deal of amygdala-based anxiety. As noted in chapter 1, the lateral nucleus of your amygdala creates emotional memories based on your experiences, and these memories can lead you to respond to certain objects or situations as if they are dangerous. Because of these memories, you're conscious of a feeling of discomfort, fear, or dread. However, you don't realize that this feeling is due to an emotional memory because the memory isn't stored as an image or verbal information. It isn't like an old photograph or movie in your mind, as cortex-based memories can be. Instead, you experience an amygdala-based memory directly. So you get the emotion. That's so fascinating. You get the emotion right away as an emotional state. So you simply begin feeling a specific emotion. If this feeling is anxiety, it's easy to assume that having a fearful or anxious feeling is an accurate reflection of the dangerousness of a situation if you don't understand the language of the amygdala. So that's the end of the passages of, of that book that I wanted to share. But I remember looking back on my anxiety. What I remember is that the panic episodes I would experience on a day-to-day -day basis was a signal from my body that there were many snakes within me that I needed to contend with. Now, I, I do agree with the passage in this book about the amygdala forming 
emotions directly, not pertaining to an image or a movie, but also there are the, the cortical engaging in 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 reflection of certain emotional memories can produce images or movies that we can work with in order to <clears throat> lessen the emotional response associated, right? Because yes, in situations like being at the art gallery and having a panic attack, there I got I had the emotional reaction when I was in that environment, right? I got the panic and anxiety. But then later down the road, <clears throat> reflecting on that emotional memory, I was able to look at the video. I still have the video in my mind of what happened. It's not as emotional, but we can work with that video to get in touch or that movie or, sorry, that picture to re-associate different emotions to that event, right? So we can actually look at those m images and movies and then create new associations. We can bring up the emotions and then work with those emotions and then release those emotions. And so we are no longer stuck in the past. Unbelievable. Like that was huge. I highly recommend you go back and re-listen to this because that is massive and pick up the book as well because in the book also um, the authors get into how we can work with these systems, how we can work with the cortex, how we can work with the amygdala to lessen anxiety. Really, really great. The next book I want to dive into is one by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, famous clinical psychologist, famous intellectual and public speaker. 12 more rules for life. And within the 12 rules, there is one and there are a couple of rules that really speak to me and I find very, very valuable. Rule seven, work as hard as you possibly can on at least one thing and see what happens. It means a lot to me because as you know from earlier in my 20s, I was aimless. And I had no North Star to strive towards. So finding an aim and building upon a structure was crucial for me to, to find that meaning within my life. And so here is the passage before I elaborate more on that. Here is the passage I want to share. When coal is subjected to intense heat and pressure, far below the Earth's surface, its atoms rearrange themselves into the perfect repeating crystalline alignment, characterizing a diamond. The carbon that makes up coal also becomes maximally durable in its diamond form, as diamond is the hardest of all substances. Finally, it becomes capable of reflecting light. This combination of durability and glitter gives a diamond the qualities that justify its use as a symbol of value. That which is valuable is pure, properly aligned, and glitters with light. And this is true for the person just as it is for the gem. Light, of course, signifies the shining brilliance of heightened and focused consciousness. Human beings are conscious during the day when it is light. Much of that consciousness is visual and and therefore dependent on light. To be illuminated or enlightened is to be exceptionally awake and aware, to attain a state of being commonly associated with divinity. To wear a diamond is to become associated with the radiance of the sun, like the king or queen whose profile is stamped on the sun-like disk of the gold coin, a near-universal standard of worth. Heat and pressure transform the base matter of common coal into the crystalline perfection and rare value of the diamond. The same can be said of a person. We know that the multiple forces operating in the human soul are often not aligned with one another. We do the things we wish we would not do and do not do the things we know we should do. 
We want to be thin, but we sit on the couch eating Cheetos and despairing. We are directionless, confused, and paralyzed by indecision. We are pulled in all directions by temptations despite our stated will, and we waste time. We procrastinate and feel terrible about it, but we do not change. It was, such, it was for such reasons that archaic people found it easy to believe that the human soul was haunted by ghosts, possessed by ancestral spirits, demons, and gods, none of whom necessarily had the best interests of the person at heart. Since the time of the psychoanalysts, these contrary forces, these obsessive and sometimes malevolent spirits have been conceptualized psychologically as impulses, emotions, or motivational states, or as co complexes, which act like partial personalities united within the person by memory, but not by intent. Our neurological structure is indeed hierarchical. The powerful instinct Instinctual servants at the bottom, governing thirst, hunger, rage, sadness, elation, and lust, can easily ascend and become our masters, and just as easily wage war with one another. The resilience and strength of a united spirit is not easy to attain. A house divided against itself, proverbial, proverbial, I can't even say that, proverbially, cannot stand. Likewise, a poorly integrated person cannot hold himself together when challenged. He loses union at the highest level of psychological organization. He loses the properly balanced admixture of properties that is another feature of the well-tempered soul and cannot hold his self together. We know this when we say, he lost it or he just fell apart. Before he picks up the pieces and rearranges them, such a person is likely to fall prey to dominion by one or more partial personalities. This might be a spirit of rage, anxiety, or pain, leaping in to occupy the person when his temper is lost. You can see this occurring most clearly in the case of a two-year-old having a tantrum. He has lost himself temporarily and is, for the moment, pure emotion. I love that because I love this chapter because it reminds me of how directionless I was and how I was consumed by the many deities, as Peterson was laying out here, of, of lust and all of these desires within me. And being a servant to them like a puppet, not having any control over them. And then I noticed that when my aim was to slay one of these, these gods that were only leading me into more of a hellish state, that's where a lot of the meaning came from was pursuit, was pursuit, was through struggle, right? Suffering is where you find the meaning. Like in Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, the suffering, the meaning came through the suffering. You have to suffer through the gym to see results. You have to suffer through the beginning steps of meditation to see the results. And also, when I was going through anxiety recovery, actually at the beginning, finding a program, having an aim, having a structured approach, it actually, what this, do, what this did for me was all the possibilities of what I could be shrunk down into this one thing that was manageable. So I, I worked on a program. That was my goal of the day. I'm going to go to the library today and I'm going to work on this program for me. I'm going to study this. I'm going to pursue this path of anxiety recovery. Having that aim brought upon so much more down the road. For example, I started to look into the application process of getting into the camera 
union here in Toronto. I always loved working in film and I wanted to pursue more. But here's the thing. I learned through anxiety recovery that you have to break down these larger goals into smaller, manageable micro goals, goals that can be attainable. And then because I was attaining these small micro goals, I realized that I could apply this formula to getting to something I really enjoy. Because I I climbed this mountain of anxiety recovery, I it built it built upon my conf, confidence and competence. And I realized that if I pursue my goal of getting into this union that before I, I I would say I could never get into it. I'm not capable enough. It's too difficult, too too high of a mountain. Now I thought, okay, well, if I chunk this down into manageable goals, maybe today I'll just read about the application process. Tomorrow, you know, then I'm going to update my resume. I'm going to work on my cover letter letter the next day. So having small, small goals to attain every day built upon my competence and brought a lot of meaning because I had a, I had a drive. I had something to wake up to. I had somewhere to go today. And that's why I love that passage. And then also another rule I loved from 12 More Rules for Life is rule eight, make one room in your home as beautiful as possible. This resonates with me because like I've said before on this podcast, if you have a messy home, that's a direct reflection of the state of your own mind. Uh, What happens when you walk into a messy room? Immediate anxiety because there are obstacles, right? When an obstacle pops up in your way, negative emotion, right? So imagine a room being messy is consistent. It's, It's consisting of many snakes, to contend with. And there's, you know, to contend with a snake that requires you to expend emotional energy, right? And you don't want to do that, right? You have enough energy wasting on your anxiety or your, your health anxiety and all all the other stuff you're contending with in the day. And when you see those snakes, you go, Oh my God, look at all these snakes. But yeah, that's true. But like I said, Break it down into manageable action steps. How about you clean a little bit of a corner today? And then you'll see, hey, that produced a little bit of a dopamine kick. I feel pretty good about accomplishing that. Maybe I can do more. And the energy of that dopamine will drive you into more manageable steps. And so you make one room beautiful and then it's it's a reflection of of it's a reflection the beauty is a reflection it's like when a man confronts a beautiful woman the man is paralyzed by the beauty they can't the the man can't comprehend what what is happening within him but the beauty of the woman brings about the inadequacies within oneself, that you could be more, that you could be more. It's like me when I watch The Rock in a movie and he's extremely, extremely, extremely ripped, right? He's so disciplined and I can't help but feel, oh, I could do more. I could do more. When you come into contact with these great people, you just can't help but feel like I can do more. And so, what I, what I mean by the room in this sense is that when you walk into a room and it's beautifully laid out and it's proper, there's a sense of great satisfaction as well as the room is presenting itself as a place where everything is in its right place and, and there are no snakes in the garden, right? And you can take a breath and you can be like, oh, you know what? I feel pretty good about this. I feel pretty good about this space and, and, and keep building upon it, introduce some great works of art as well. And so that's why I love that chapter is because 
it, beauty is absolutely important and it requires taste. It doesn't require money. It requires taste. That's why I love the minimalism movement because reducing all of the clutter is going to provide you with a lot of mental space as well as physical space, especially physical space, but mental space. Keep that in mind. The next book I want to dive into is Your Brain on Porn by Gary Wilson. Um, we're, we're switching gears here today because I wanted to include this. I haven't included this in, I don't believe, in uh, in the, the, the series that I've done, Great Knowledge I Learned from Book Series. Um, and I'll, I'll leave a link to those episodes below so you can listen to those too. But uh, I love this book because... Pornography recovery is a big thing for me, and I'm I'm going through recovery now. I'm four years clean, more than four years clean uh, of pornography, and I'm very, very proud of myself for climbing this mountain. It was one of the great mountains I climbed in my later 20s, and pornography was a huge influence over me for more than a decade of my life. And I used books like this one and another one called Cupid's Poisoned Arrow as a tool for me to attach reasons to why I should leave porn behind, why I should sacrifice this um, and attach a lot of pain to pornography and a lot of pleasure to change. And this is a great book for me. I, I keep this book close to my heart because... Pornography recovery was an unbelievable battle for me. But anyways, I want to read this passage. And it pertains to pornography and its effects on romance. Relationships, too, are affected by porn use, which makes sense. Too much stimulation can interfere with what scientists call pair bonding or falling in love. When scientists jacked up pair bonding animals on amphetamine. The naturally monogamous animals no longer formed a preference for one partner. That's so fascinating. Artificial abnormality intense stimulation hijacks their pair bonding machinery, leaving them just like regular promiscuous mammals in which the brain circuits for lasting bonds are muted. Let me repeat that last line there. In which the brain circuits for lasting bonds are muted. Research in humans also suggests that too much stimulation weakens pair bonds. According to a 2007 study, mere exposure to numerous sexy female images causes a man to devalue his real-life partner. He rates her lower not only on attractiveness, but also on warmth and intelligence. Also, after porn consumption, subjects of both sexes report less satisfaction with their intimate partner, including the partner's affection, appearance, sexual curiosity, and performance, and both men and women assign increased importance to sex without emotional involvement. There are now over 70 studies, most fairly recent, linking internet porn use to sexual problems, lower arousal to sexual stimuli, and reduced sexual and relationship satisfaction. In fact, in men, higher porn consumption is consist consistently associated with reduced enjoyment of sexual intimacy with a partner. And then social anxiety and self-esteem. As users manage to abstain from porn, their desire to connect with others great generally surges. Often so does their self-esteem their ability to look others in the eye, their sense of humor, their optimism, their attractiveness to potential mates, and so forth. Even those formerly suffering from severe social anxiety often explore new avenues 
for social contact, smiling and joking with work colleagues, online dating, meditation groups, joining clubs, night sports, and so forth. In some cases, it takes months, but for others, the shift is so rapid that it catches them by surprise. In his famous TED Talk, The Demise of Guys, well-known psychologist Philip Zimbardo noted that arousal addiction, so porn and video games, is a major factor in the increase in social awkwardness and anxiety among digital natives. Zimbardo's hypothesis is that excessive screen time can interfere with development of normal social skills. Already, 10 studies link porn use to anxiety, with, with an 11th linking it to shyness. Hmm, that's interesting. However, this doesn't explain the increase in confidence and extroversion after quitting or why some guys improve so quickly. In the brain that changes itself, psychiatrist Norman Doyage suggests that the inter intense stimulation of today's porn hijacks and rewires brain real estate that would otherwise be devoted to making social ties rewarding. Real people become less rewarding. Fake people become more enticing. That's so fascinating because... Uh, that, that's the end of the passage. That's so fascinating because when I was watching a, much pornography, I was interested in women who were more of the Tinkerbell type, you know, who were easygoing, who would have a few drinks and then be intimate. And I was repelled by, of, repelled by many of the Wendy type women, women who were exceptionally beautiful and who wanted um, a, a more of a social connection and to start a family rather than to have a good time. And that's so fascinating because when I met Maggie years ago, when I was battling this addiction, I remember thinking, well, Maggie is not the typical woman I would usually date. And, oh man, I don't know if this is going to work out. And then the more I was with Maggie, the more, and the more I was, the more I was separating myself from porn, I realized that the social desires increased and the desires for this fantasy hedonism was decreasing. And my desires to pursue these flings, these extravagant experiences that would fulfill my desires sexually, they were becoming less and less in to the point where now they are non-existent. And now I, I value connection. I value honesty. I value discipline. And the list goes on and on. And the, you have to separate yourself from the thing that you can't seem to control and see what happens. And like rule eight, or sorry, rule seven of 12 more rules for life, work as hard as you can on at least one thing and see what happens. Work hard at one thing, pick a name, pick a North Star, strive towards that thing. See what happens. You know, and what could be more exciting than that? At the time, my life was boring. I was just doing the same patterns over and over again. But sacrificing this thing that meant so much to my ego, this was so exciting. I was like, man, imagine if I could actually progress through this or imagine going a month without this. How would I feel? And then I thought I would feel like a, a new person. This is the warrior. This is the warrior path. Many people can't do this. None of my friends did this. This was all coming from within me. Because my life reached rock bottom to the point where I decided, you know what? It's not worth... It's not worth sticking to what I already know. 
so much of me has to burn away and I'm willing to let that go for, for something new and interesting to happen. And that's where I'm going to leave you today on this podcast. Thank you everybody for being here, listening all the way through because it's been a long one today, but it's been worth it. I'm sure. Please leave your reviews on Spotify. It'll help generate more presence over the podcast. I would greatly appreciate it. And that's all I ask. And I want to know what books have really impacted you because if I haven't read it, I would want to read it. I want to read it. So um, please leave those below if if you're listening on YouTube. And lastly, rise above anxiety. I will see you next time. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com.